So good morning or good evening, depending where you are in the world. I'm Janet Gilla, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Open Classroom. For those of you joining us on the Zoom webinar, you've probably figured out that we can't see or hear you. We also can't call on raise hands, but the chat feature is available, and we would love for you to check in with us throughout the program and um, have your questions included in the discussion. I want to welcome anybody joining on YouTube, either here right now through our live feed or the recording later, make you aware that we're not able to moderate Q&A through YouTube. So just to give you a sense of what we have coming up later on this week, Open Classroom is a service that is free and open to absolutely everybody. We'd love to have you come back and share our events. We'll be back on tomorrow. Professor Sean Joe is delivering a talk on improving Black male well-being, economic mobility and equity. Um, and then on Thursday the 20th, our interim co-dean Rodrigo Riaz is delivering a talk on people, health and place, a discussion of place-based factors that contribute to health disparity. But today's program, we're bringing together two themes of, that we're, we've developed within the Open Classroom series. One is our Inclusive Perspectives series, which pertains to inclusion of people with disabilities. And then the other is the Brown School, Brown School Curriculum Showcase, where we are giving people a sense of the different concentrations and specializations that are possible here within uh, the, the Brown School's degrees program. So I'm joined by my two colleagues, each of whom is a partner um, in one of these efforts, and we're coming together um, to bring it all to you today. So Sarah Birch is the Brown School's Associate Director of Admissions and Recruitment, and, and she's here with a special uh, shout out in the chat for uh, prospective students. Any questions that you may have about the admissions process, Sarah is here. Um, and then we're also joined by Jean-Francois Trani, who's Associate Professor of Public Health and the chair of our global health specialization. So just briefly as a researcher, I'll, I'll explain Dr. Trani investigates the intersection of mental health, disability, vulnerability, and poverty with a focus on conducting field research that informs policy and service design for individuals in conflict, uh, fragile, uh, conflict affected fragile states or low income countries. Um, he's gonna be introducing our speaker and moderating your questions later in the program. Jean-Francois, will you please get us started today? Sure, thank you, Janet. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy and honored to introduce Professor Srilata Juva, who is a social worker um, with uh, a PhD in psychiatric social work, um, and is currently a professor with a Center for Equity and Justice for Children and Families at the School of Social Work at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai, India, who is also a partner of Washington University. Professor Juva has over 25 years of teaching and clinical practice experience. Uh, she, carries, uh, she cares deeply about manifesting full potential and fairness in self and others. She served on the boards of many NGOs and academic uh, boards institutions for studies and uh, universities. Uh, uh, area of expertise uh, includes mental health, disability, disaster mental health and therapeutic interventions. She has directed many research projects, including with me, and I'm really happy about this collaboration, has published in multiple peer-reviewed national and international journals, uh, written uh, multiple chapters in edited books. She has also co-edited books on social work practice and families. She was awarded the Fulbright Senior Research Fellow in 2006-2007. She has been an enthusiastic volunteer in disaster situations with expertise in rendering services and building capacity in psychosocial care. She's also trained um, as a practitioner coach in radical transformational leadership and uses these transformative templates and tools in everyday practice, both in her personal and professional life. She uses the transformative design templates in her teaching, fieldwork, practice with students and NGOs and in research. So I'm looking forward to uh, Professor Juva's presentation. Um, thanks again for accepting uh, our invitation and I hope you will all have a lot of uh, uh, questions. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody, and I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, when JF asked me, can I, uh, can I uh, uh, do this lecture, I mean, I couldn't uh, say yes, because uh, 
I guess that kind of uh, association and relationship that Jeff and I have built over the years. So happy to be here and thank you for your invitation once again. So uh, I have been asked to talk about my experiences uh, in, um, in India in the sector of disability, uh, particularly all kinds of disability with specific reference to mental health as well. So, um, um, and uh, uh, before I begin the presentation, I want to talk about where this presentation is located. So um, the experiences for this presentation comes from my work with, uh, a, 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 with an NGO, with a non-governmental organization that works in a slum in Mumbai. And, uh, uh, and the theoretical framework for this comes from uh, the radical transformational leadership, the theories of that, particularly the conscious full spectrum response model proposed by uh, Dr. Monica Sharma. Um, so I'll just get started. I will present a slide. Um, and before I present the slide, I, while I'm getting my slide set organized, I would really like for us to um, inquire into ourselves and ask ourselves, what is it that I truly and deeply care about? What is the purpose of my life? What do I really want to manifest in my life? So as we think about that, I'll get my slide set started. Yes, here we go. What do I truly deeply care about in this world for myself, for, my, for others? What do I want to manifest in this world? Uh, is my uh, screen share, is my uh, block, is something blocking here? Is there a black box on my screen? No, it's all good. We, we can see your slides, oh. uh, Sriata. It's, okay. it's great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not able to access the chat. Will someone, may I request someone to read this out for me? Of course, yes, I'll do that. I will monitor the chat for, for you. Okay, thank you. So what is it that I deeply care about in this world? Uh, despite the virtual mode, let's make it a little interactive. When I know what I deeply care about, I can make the invisible visible. And that's why it's important for us to touch that core of ourselves so that we really manifest what we care about. So one person indicated uh, helping others is an important uh -huh. uh, thing. Serving and caring, lovely, okay. Caring about youth, particularly those who have been historically excluded. So this is uh, uh -huh. Mr. Parks, before was Mrs. Um, Anne Gordon. Uh -huh. Oh, so when we care about youth who are excluded, we're also talking about being inclusive, right? Beautiful, thank you. Any other? Pamela says, empowering people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And when I empower people, and when you empower people, um, do you foster their agency? What do you do? What 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 happens when uh, when when you empower people with disabilities? So I, I don't have a response, but I have more equity amplifying the voices of those who have historically been marginalized. Margin, uh, care about uh, marginalized identities and minority groups. Um, I care about helping others uh, and work in, and this uh, colleague work in the field of disabilities, um, support services and advocacy, as well as having uh, a son with developmental disabilities. Um, another um, colleague said, uh, or, Panel uh, person said, supporting and being of service to those who need a support member and may, may feel they can, they cannot advocate for themselves, encouraging and providing empathy. 
Um, so visa professional working yeah. with people uh, with disabilities. Lovely, lovely. So a lot of empowering, yes. Ah, thank you so much. So when we empower people with disability, we also get empowered, right? We're able to realize the full potential within myself, within others. And that's such a beautiful process. Um, so your responses actually warm my heart. And it's so wonderful that that is why we are here today. We're here today because of what we care about deeply. So to build on what you have said, what are the values? So let us say that, you know, all when we say, we, let's say that you, you cannot work with people with disability anymore. You have to work with, let's say, the trees in the forest, because Janet loves trees. So you work with trees in the forest. You still carry the same value of empathy, the same value of equity, the same value of care, the same value of uh, you know, full potential. That's how we, we are wired to conduct ourselves in this world. This is our, this is who we are being and that doesn't change. So the values that I embody, the universal values, uh, and the, I use the word universal here because it applies to everyone everywhere. No one is left behind. Okay, so universal values that underpin this presentation are inclusion, and which is also the title of this presentation, dignity, equity, justice. Justice is again a very important company, uh, value of uh, social work, justice and dignity, compassion and full potential. So these are the values that underline this presentation and the work that we do. So I know that most of you work with people with disabilities, but for the benefit of those who do not, I, here's a quick introduction to what is disability. Um, so I've taken the UNCRPD, the United Nations Convention of Persons with Disability definition to say people with disabilities are those people who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairments, which, I mean, not that they exist in isolation, they interact with various barriers that hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So a lot of, so this uh, definition talks about how everything is dependent on other contexts and it is also relative because it talks about not just me as a person, but talks about me as a person as I interact with others and how do I compare myself with others. So this definition is also in keeping with the WHO, the World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health, popularly known as ICF, where the focus is on the environment and the context. So let's look at what that means. Oh, sorry. So this is what this is the uh, this is the de depiction of this uh, international classification of functioning, disability, and health. It says that when I have a disorder or a disease, let's say I have a polio, and a body function or a body structure, my legs, I have a polio of my right arm, and that is that is in, that is affected. I cannot perform activities because I'm right-handed. I cannot perform activities using my right hand. So for example, if I have a door handle that, that, is, that is towards to the right, to my right, then I have difficulty opening it with my right. I need to use my left hand to open the door. However, there are certain environmental factors. For example, if the door handle is in the middle of the door, or if I have a sensor that you know, opens the door automatically for me, or if the handle is you know, to my left, then I don't face problems in participating and using this, uh, you know, entry, ent entering and exiting from this door. Or I could have personal factors where I say, you know, I'm not going to let this door limit my mobility. I will do what it takes to navigate myself through this door. Okay, so that is what this uh, model tells us that the contextual factors and the health condition interact with each other 
to determine to what extent I can perform an activity and to what extent it affects my participation in everyday life and in society. Um, I just want to quickly share with you some facts about uh, data about uh, disability in India, just so that we have a rough understanding of what the magnitude is like. About 2.2% of people have disability in India, that is 26.8 million, 15 million men and 11.8 million women. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and this is also in concurrence with the Census of India um, uh, data. 18.6 million live in rural areas and 8.1 million live in urban areas. So you can imagine to what extent, um, you know, um, the neglect about or, or the invisibility of disability is particularly in rural areas where facilities are far and few between. Uh, this graph depicts literacy and there are about 55% people who have um, uh, who have literacy, of which 62% are men and 45% are women. It's important to note that only 8.5% of people with disability acquire a graduate degree. And this is important because the people who get employed in white collar jobs who have a say in what happens um, in terms of policy, in terms of you know, uh, implementation of schemes, in terms of running an organization, or in terms of taking, making decisions, there are only 8.5% of people of the 2.2%. So that's the representation that is so skewed and therefore and makes it all the more invisible. Um, so unemployment is a very uh, high. And if we don't have training programs by the end of this year, we'll have over 10 million people with disability completely unemployed, and that's a huge uh, uh, number. And uh, the loss of GDP due to uh, exclusion of people with disabilities is about 5 to 7 percent. And the cost to rural economy is 5.5 percent. And um, uh, even though this data is from 2002 study, it is still relevant today because one fourth of the annual income uh, is spent on accessing services for uh, for a person with disability in the family. So then, what will it what will it leave us with? So there's further uh, you know uh, moving into poverty and so on and so forth. So you see how the structures themselves uh, you know limit and and impair the way uh, people with disabilities are located. 10.5 years are lost due to disability for every 100 people with disability and uh, for every 100 people. So that's a huge number again. And that, of course, has a direct linkage with loss to G GDP. Um, again, for the benefit of uh, people who have a very little idea about disability, um, I quickly run through the models of disability uh, that are uh, typically followed. We have the model or the religious model, which talks about um, disability because of the wrath of God and punishment and sin concept. In India, we call it karma. Uh, though, I mean, I know the definition of karma is completely skewed here. Then we have the medical model, which is the biomedical model, which pathologizes the individual and locates the problem in the individual. And therefore, it's also known as a personal tragedy model. It says that you, no one else can do anything. The problem is you. You have a polio of your life. You deal with it. I can't change the door for you. I mean, the door has nothing to do with your disability. Then we have the charity model because I can do nothing. I am made to feel dependent. I am, um, and therefore society is very benevolent towards me. And um, and the victim, and I continue to be a victim of uh, my impairment, not victim of circumstances and nobody takes responsibility therefore, but there is benevolence. Then there is the social um, model, which talks about how disability is socially constructed. And, um, and, and, and well, um, and therefore, uh, you know, we cannot ignore the contextual or the environmental factors that actually impair while by, by posing barriers. Then we have the identity model, which is also the affirmation model, uh, which says, you know, um, 
why should I uh, not take into account uh, my identity as a person with disability? I mean, I take pride in my, in my disabled status. And that's why the word disabled is also used um, as uh, in the place of a person with disability. And, and that's pride in using that word. And then we have the rights model, which talks about dignity for a person with disability besides other rights as an entitlement. Um, the social model of disability, I borrowed this from um, um, Yokotani, and uh, it's from Islam and uh, his colleague. Um, I've taken this diagram from this uh, paper by Islam and his colleague. And uh, they say, it talks about how disability is socially is located in the social structure and, um, uh, and, and the socio-political context is what causes more of an impairment than the impairment, what causes more of the disability than the impairment itself. And that's why this is um, you know, the social model. So they say, uh, so he says that inaccessible physical and institutional barriers. So for example, I don't have access to an education facility. I don't have uh, an, a, an accommodating workplace or an inflexible, uh, or I have an inflexible employment. Um, these um, you know, other and they cause segregation for people with disability, and um, either by way of having no social network of my family um, hides me, is ashamed about my uh, uh, my impairment, and you know therefore it takes the medical model, and then it it also is aligns with or it, it, it interacts or intersects with uh, cultural beliefs and social prejudice cultural beliefs which, which you know, induce fear, that stigmatize. And the prejudice which further stigmatizes and makes uh, everything, including information and transport and education and medical facilities inaccessible. So all of these in the social structure of poverty actually cause the, uh, cause those barriers and cause limits in the way of, in, in my functioning, in my ability to manifest my full potential. So, the underlying belief of this presentation, again, is that every individual, including a person with disability, can lead a fulfilling life, can contribute to society, and can contribute, um, and, can, and, and can work productively. And we need to, and, and, and therefore, experience a sense of well-being. And that is what, uh, and that is what uh, these, these social structures and problems aim to limit or interrupt. So we say disability is not within the individual, the social model says, disability is not within the individual, it's a result of societal structures and organization. Um, so I'm going to give you an example here. Um, let's take the example of a wheelchair user. Um, as a wheelchair user, okay, let's say that I have a polio of both my legs and as a wheelchair user, I, I, I have difficulty in accessing stairs simply because ramps are not provided. Um, in India, at least, and it's only in the recent past, in the recent decade or less, that we have ramps in public spaces. Otherwise, ramps were not considered as important for us to, for public spaces and buildings to have. So uh, as a wheelchair user, I cannot access these public spaces, whether it's a movie hall, whether it's a temple or a, or a place of worship. And therefore, um, you know, I am confined to my home spaces. And never mind it's a school in school, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, teachers um, have pity on me and uh, therefore they give me the ground floor class too. Okay. Um, so, however, because of the inaccessible social structures and the way uh, services are organized, I'm not able to um, you know, access them. In if the the, uh, the state or the city or the school could make services available and accessible for me, then I would be able to participate in everything. I can be an individual in my own right rather than having to be dependent on somebody else. And therefore, I can function dependently. I can independently. I can take my own decisions. I can, I can accomplish all that I want to accomplish. It's, it's the environment that limits me. And when that happens, what, what, what really uh, takes place is that prejudice 
that is biases, unfavorable attitudes, which I have, which people have collected over time or have assumed, leads to discrimination. Where the other thing of a person with disability happens in a less favorable manner. So having said this, let's look at some questions. Which of these, uh, uh, which of the models apply to the statements here? My Indian grandmother, I say this in India because in India, uh, most marriages are typically arranged and that's why I'm using the word my Indian grandmother. My Indian grandmother says that my mother refused to marry the man she had arranged for me to be married. And therefore I am born with an impairment. Which model do you think it, 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 it reflects? Can we have uh, responses, please? Is it a medical model? Is it the uh, uh, religious model? Is it the charity model? Is it the social model? Is it the identity model? The rights model? So I have several responses <laughs> going towards religious, moral, tradition, religious, moral. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Thank you. I use a wheelchair for mobility and you use your legs. We both can function as efficient therapists. What difference does it make to our work? I'm good as I am. Which model does this reflect? Someone says equity. Um, I would personally say social, but uh, I'm waiting for. Yeah, someone as well agrees with me. Someone says identity. That's yeah, right. Have, it is the identity model. If she's identity. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I take pride in my work. I'm good and I'm good too, you know? Okay. The restaurant does not offer a braille menu card, and therefore I do not enjoy going there. Which model does this pertain to? Someone says social. Briona. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. The last one. I'm repeatedly told that I cannot find a job because I have an impairment. Oops. Pardon my error. I cannot find a job because I have an impairment. So I have a couple of identity, one charity in the, in the chat. Oh. One is rights, two rights, mm -hmm. social rights, social, social rights. Oh, this locates, yeah, this locates the problem in the individual. I don't have, I have an impairment, so I will not be given a job. So it's largely a medical model, right? Because it locates impairment in me and the problem is me. It's not, it's not because the workplace cannot uh, afford accommodation for me, a reasonable accommodation for me. All right, thank you, Jeff, for your help. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry. Be cool. uh, I, I hear I'd like to quote um, uh, Robert Hensel, as we all know, he's the first wheelchair user who did a wheelie. He has a spina bifida and uh, he used a, he, he ran uh, wheelies and, uh, and he really made it big there. So he says, um, he says, placing one foot in front of the other, I've climbed to higher lengths, reaching beyond my own limitations to show my inner strength. No obstacle too hard for this warrior to overcome. I'm just a man on a mission to prove my disability hasn't won. I like this quote because it keeps telling us that, you know, we still miles to go. And for us to kind of, uh, you know, to be able to uh, go uh, deal with the miles to go, what is it that I need to do? 
how do i break the barriers that come in the way of my uh, of me of my functioning how how do i interrupt on disempowering practices how do i interrupt discriminatory practices that hinder me from manifesting my full potential from leading a meaningful life from contributing to society despite my impairment albert einstein gives us a little uh, clarity a little tip as to how to go about this he says the world we have made as a result of the level of thinking we have done thus far creates problems that we cannot solve at the same level at which we have created them we shall require a substantially new manner of thinking if humankind is to survive so this means that that in order for me to break down these barriers interrupt these barriers to 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 transform disempowering and life diminishing practices i need to do something substantially new okay because i can't attack them or i cannot uh, sorry uh, confront them at the same level at which they are i can't tell society no no what you doing is wrong i can no, i can't give awareness and say well your awareness my awareness programs tell you what are the causes of disability it has nothing to do with me no you can make uh, the environment more supportive merely doing that is not adequate so what do i need to do let me give you the story of radha radha uh, came to us when she was about uh, i guess 6 or 8 years old and uh, uh, she has polio of both legs she had polio she has polio of both legs and she also had some learning difficulties and she was a left hand left hand uh, so she had polio of one leg she had a learning disability and she she was left handed not right handed uh, she was enrolled into school and she was okay as long as she reached uh, um, i guess um, class 2 so when she reached the second grade uh, was when she started facing difficulties because she had to climb up one stair one flight of stairs to reach her classroom her mother she was able to walk with uh, despite her polio with with calipers and uh, her mother would drop her at school and she would find her way to the class and uh, sometimes her classmates and would support her uh, um, but when her classroom was shifted to the to the first floor it was difficult for her in india we call the uh, the first floor is actually um, okay is your second floor am i right because we the the floor at the level of the ground is called the ground floor in india so when i say first floor i mean the first floor okay i mean the second floor of your soul um, so um so when she had to reach her uh, her classroom she found it difficult and um, because of her learning difficulties and the fatigue of climbing up the stairs she wouldn't pay much attention and her teacher would get very annoyed with her non performance in class and when she would ask questions she was a bright chirpy girl so she would constantly ask questions uh, just to kind of you know uh, get herself keep abreast with the rest of her class and when, uh, when when whenever she would ask questions the teacher would shut her down and not and later i mean a month later her teacher called her mother and said you know what we can't deal with your child not only does she does she not understand what is being taught but she she comes to class and sleeps and others laugh at her so it's not helpful for us to so please do something about it so the mother came to us uh, uh, with this concern the mother also had uh, some bit of an anxiety disorder not some the mother was diagnosed to have mild anxiety and moderate anxiety disorder uh, which we discovered much later of course um her, she uh, radha's father consumed alcohol uh, rather abused alcohol and there were occasions when he would beat up the wife black and blue and um and, and uh, radha had a younger sibling who also needed care and the younger sibling was a boy so the boy was most preferred as compared to radha considering uh, the fact that she also had an impairment so when uh, the mother said you know i can't spend any more money on her and there's really because they live in a low income community uh, there's really nothing i can do 
So uh, she spoke to my colleague Chitra and said, you know, what can be done? So Chitra said, so we, uh, Chitra referred her to, uh, to, uh, to the hospital, the orthopedic hospital, and they said they could do a surgery for her free of cost. But uh, the mother needed some money to kind of, uh, you know, go back and forth. Um, and the post-op care required a little bit of money as well. So Chitra found funding for this child. And um, when the mother reported to Chitra about this, uh, about her learning difficulties, Chitra suggested that we can enroll her into the remedial classes that were conducted by this organization. So uh, while this was taken care of, uh, the mother continued, uh, so, but, but the child couldn't attend school, uh, couldn't attend classes, one because of her surgery and two because the classroom was on the first floor. So we had to speak to the teacher and to the school principal to be able to, uh, you know, shift the classroom. Um, initially, the principal was reluctant, but later uh, the principal gave in when we cited legislations, policies, and how, and also supported the the principal in uh, in ways of ensuring that she makes her school accessible for all children including children with disabilities. So whether it was a ramp or whether, you know, uh, uh, and, and also talk about how inclusive education is, and is, is also mandated by the state. So all of this together, and she could get some money to build, to re, to build infrastructure for the school. So all, of this, um, so all of this intervention took place and the principal seemed very excited about the prospect of making her school a model school in the municipal ward that the school was located in. Um, alongside Chitra also, um, uh, so alongside uh, uh, we also, about uh, Chitra and I, uh, facilitated workshops for the school where the teachers and the principal of this school and two other schools were able to source what they deeply cared about and manifest it in their work um, uh, in their school and simultaneously see what are those uh, disempowering structures and practices uh, that limit full participation of children with disability in school. And that's how the, uh, the awakening happened. So let's look at what happened to Radha using the conscious full spectrum response model. Now, this is a model that is given by Monica Sharma in 2017. She has tried this model in about 65 countries over 25 years um, and has generated results worldwide. And therefore, it's a tested and proven model. The conscious full spectrum response model says, when I anchor myself or source my universal values to shift unworkable systems and cultural norms and generate a result simultaneously, I can, I can create sustainable and equitable results. And when it is sustained over a period of time, it becomes a paradigm shift. So let's look at, let's distinguish this from a, a partial response from a full spectrum response. So rather needed uh, needed sleep but she was to leave school she needed someone to speak to her teachers and sh shift her classroom and she needed some financial help so that was why did. the school did not seem to support initially uh, in, did not initially request for a change of classroom the school did not support so she was enrolled into remedial education um, she was also, uh, uh, the principal and the school teacher uh, were met with frequently. The principal and the school teacher were met with frequently to negotiate for uh, shifting classrooms and other structures. While the principal had a side to her, which, which really demonstrated care and inclusiveness for all, she didn't know how to go about it because of lack of knowledge. Now, all of these are responses. Um, however, these are partial responses. 
A full spectrum response is when the principal, the NGO, and the, the family sources the universal values of dignity, fairness, compassion, full potential, shifts unworkable systems, providing support for remedial education, shifting the classroom from one floor to the other, ensuring that accessible infrastructure is built, ensuring that there are uh, that attitudinal barriers or, uh, are broken down or, or interrupted, ensuring that there is acceptance of disability in the school, in the classroom, and, and providing education simultaneously. That's when a sustainable and an equitable result can be generated. I'm just going to check for time. Okay. Um, so for Radha, for Radha, what we did was over a period of uh, three months and at every interaction, we ensured that not only the school in which Radha studied, but other two other schools in the neighborhood, the principal and the teachers were able to source their universal values, okay, and shift systems, particularly, you know, systems related to infrastructure, systems related to admission processes, systems related to, uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 recruitment of teachers, etc. So it, their criteria was developed for teachers to be compassionate, to care about children with all kinds of um, disadvantages and build inclusive infrastructure. Uh, we also looked at cultural uh, norms, particularly attitudes towards disability, uh, disempowering attitudes, disempowering practices, sniggering, bullying, all of this which we see in schools also happens particularly with children with disability. So, all, so how can we shift all of these while at the same time providing education, providing material health, providing, um, you know, um, um, and, and providing support. So, this, I'm going to illustrate this with an example. So, uh, the, the project stands for fairness, dignity, compassion, and full potential, and justice. Oops, sorry. And anchoring ourselves, which includes the teachers, which includes the principals, anchoring ourselves in these universal values, we, we worked towards from providing services only, from providing education only, to fostering agency in children with disability, fostering dignity for children with disability, enhancing acceptance in families, in among students, in the, and in the community. We also shifted everyday practices and biases based on primarily disability. Then we moved on to gender. We, we noticed that disability does not exist in isolation. I mean, there are intersectionalities of caste, class, religion. And that is something that we can, and, 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 and politics, but this is something that we really cannot ignore. So we wanted to move from diminishing practices to foster dignity at school, care at school, uh, peace at home because we wanted to work. With, we worked with Radha's mother to ensure that the husband uh, is is uh, you know is shifting uh, is uh, altering his behaviors and and taking care of the mother and treating her with respect. Um, and and therefore the family itself can can earn a place for themselves in society and 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 then champion the cause for for, the, for children with disability and also for uh, people with mental uh, illness as Radha's mother had. We also wanted to move from shame and stigma and exclusion to be to inclusion in school, in family and in community. I'm sorry. How do we do this? Through our counseling, through um, providing financial support, through treatment, through education and through working 
uh, through working with various systems, including the government system, because um, we not only worked with uh, uh, um, the government system, but we also worked with police, because the police helped us in being able to deal with addiction issues in the vicinity. Um, the police also helped us ensure that with it, um, uh, to ensure the children, the bullying uh, in schools are uh, minimized. Okay. So this is the response model that we adopted to be able to create an intervention or generate an inter or it's actually co-create an intervention in the community. We learned that merely responding to a problem is not enough. We also need to realize the full potential of people and the stakeholders that we work with. So again, anger ourselves in fairness and potential injustice. We not only respond to problems, we also realize the full potential of the people and work and we need to do both, respond and realize full potential. So how do we do that? When we respond by way of offering counseling, education, finance, treatment, et cetera, we realize that that alone was not in, it's a fixed issue. We also I think we lost connection suddenly. Hopefully, uh, that's Juba. just a, a drop of the internet and that she'd be back with us in, in just a minute. We were nearing the point of the presentation where I believe she was going to uh, pivot to questions, uh, encourage maybe the audience. Yes, thank you, uh, Srilata, you're back in. We would like to keep a Apologies few questions. for the internet labs. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm done, this is my last slide, so. Okay, perfect, thank you. So we can have a few questions for you, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I realized dignity and, and uh, so we realized resilience and dignity. Uh, I believe the connection is really, uh, not good right Stable. now. Stable. Mm. Ah, here she is. Okay. So, uh, uh, so we also interrupt uh, disempowering practices like patriarchy and ableism, and we do this by uh, using. This, uh, we, know, we, we, we do this by using the conscious full spectrum response model and other radical transformation tools and templates. This way, by interrupting these uh, disempowering structures, we generate a paradigm shift in order to make, to realize the sustainable development goals, um, particularly those goals that, refer, that, that, that align to disability. Uh, for example, goal, uh, yeah. I just like to end this presentation with a quote, and I'll see if I can present this. For paradigm shifts and creating a new future, we need to engage to accomplish in a manner that changes norms and systems that give rise to the problems we are trying to solve. This is simultaneously based on our oneness, our humanity, and our universal values. By Monica, thank you. These are the references, and here we go for questions. Thank you very much. Apologies if I over short time. Thank you so much, Professor Juba, for really stimulating presentations. I. Uh, I knew about the, you told me about the radical transformational leadership in the recent past. So, uh, but it's great to, to hear um, in detail about it from, from you. Uh, if, you do, if you if you agree, it would be great if you can share your slides with, uh, with us so we make them available to, 
to the audience after the, the open class. And maybe I'll, I'll take some, uh, some questions from, uh, from the chat. Um, if you if you do have uh, if you do have questions, uh, in the meantime, um, uh, Janet was suggesting. Do you want to say a couple of words about the research we we started uh, this year together in um, in Mumbai um, for 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 the students particularly? We, we never know. Some of them might be interested in in, in, in helping. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, um, so uh, thanks to Jeff and uh, Parul and Clement, uh, we have been awarded a small grant to undertake a research in a low-income community in uh, Mumbai um, um, uh, to understand uh, the consequences of COVID, the costs of COVID and vulnerability. And um, we are doing both, we are doing mixed method study using both quantitative as well as qualitative paradigm. We are hoping to uh, get started on the ground. We are waiting IRB approvals from our end. And uh, yeah, so that's what it is like, yeah. Great. <laughs> and it's, that's a very small gist of uh, this, yeah. Yeah, a, a first step, hopefully we We'll do more later then. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So one from Pamela uh, asking, given the strong impact of religious ideals and caste on the idea of disability, what are some of the strategies that you have used to, sorry, uh, create a paradigm shift in the culture? Um, a lot of times, okay. So here I would like to distinguish between um, uh, um, religious fundamentalism and religious views. Typically, universal values apply to all, whichever religion I belong to, whichever caste I belong to, whichever gender I belong to, it really doesn't matter. So when, if, and, and that's how we begin our sessions. What do you deeply care about? If I care about, uh, you know, uh, empathy, if I care about equality or equity, I ask this question, if you care about equality, what is missing in your attitude towards dis while discriminating a person of a particular religion or an impairment or gender? So when I ask this question, what is missing, the other person is able to notice gaps and plug the gaps. And while it is, and while it is, not, um, 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 while it is not the only thing that we do, the only intervention we do, we also cultivate a free, an ecosystem where together we undertake actions, we generate results together. So we all undertake small fractals of the CFSR model using the CFSR, small projects using the CFSR model to create fractals of the work that we do. And thus we are able to um, um, make a dent even with religion. And, um, and, and it's very interesting. I must share this example with you. So we have one of our colleagues. So. The, the low income community which we work in is predominantly a, a Muslim dominate, uh, dominated community. So, um, so when we celebrate uh, the festival, of, uh, Hindu festival of uh, Lord Ganesha, which is the biggest festival in Maharashtra, um, there are people who come to give some donations. So what does this, per, this, uh, this uh, volunteer who works with us do? He stores some of these, so they get bags and stuff like that. Um, to kind of distribute. So he, he follows the Islam faith and he says, I want, to, uh, uh, I want to keep some bags and give it to children with disability. Now, during Eid, again, he gets some, you know, he gets some gifts. What he does is he says, you know, only, only Muslim children have got this. What about children from uh, Hindu religion or Christians? They also deserve it, don't they? So here you know, he distributes. So on the ground, the dichotomy or the or the or the division is not really so strong unless it is fueled. The coexistence is simply awe inspiring. So, and no religion advocates hate, and that's the beauty about religion. So we we'll capitalize on that as well. Thank you. I have a, a few more questions. 
Uh, um, Brian asked about uh, aspect of the consciousness full spectrum model that would be most helpful to start with when trying to create a paradigm shift. Uh, typically, I start with universal values because that's the ground of my being and fundamental to who I am and all of us are. But all three uh, aspects of the all three circles of the conscious full spectrum response model are important. If I were to just look at universal values and not look at systems change, you don't get a paradigm shift. Without action and results, there's no paradigm shift. So all three are important. Thank you. Another question is about, you know, um, in, in India, as, uh, as it is the case in other cultural contexts, some families keep uh, family members with disabilities away from being visible from the community because of stigma, taboo, shame. And, and so the question is, do you face those challenges where you, where you work and how do you, uh, do you try to overcome them? Oh, yes, we do, lots and lots, and that's what uh, the organization has attempted to do. So what we do is we do home visits. We visit these people, we talk to them, and, um, uh, and that's how we... Uh, so we have volunteers from within the community itself, because as outsiders to the community, we may not be as welcome. So our community volunteers are our greatest strength, and they are the ones who actually go and champion, um, you know, and bring people uh, to seek help and to also you know, get out of the invisibility. Thank you. I have a couple uh, more technical questions. Someone asked about the, why do we have such difference in numbers between urban and rural uh, areas in terms of prevalence? And at the same time, I had another question about educational laws. Are, are they specific in India to students with uh, unique needs? And I think- Yes, yeah. we do have- uh, yeah, we do have uh, legislations that take care of uh, children with special needs, but and we have policies as well. So yeah, in fact, our landmark uh, uh, legislation, which is the Right to Education uh, Act, uh, has a section on children with disabilities and special needs. And the gap between uh, disability numbers in urban and rural areas um, that you presented? Uh, uh, also because children with disability or people with disability, I really don't have an answer to this question, but my guess is that it's probably, uh, you know, the numbers that we see more and, and because of the uh, migration from cities, from uh, villages to cities, most people with disabilities are left behind. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Juva, for, for this uh, great presentation. Do, do you want to... Uh, maybe uh, add anything um, uh, at the end to, to just close the, any closing thoughts? Um, uh, except that uh, we all have, yeah, I do have something to say. We all have a responsibility to create this paradigm shift. And I think it's, uh, and, and, and when we use the conscious full spectrum response model to create this paradigm shift, we, we work with others, but we do our own work as well. And results are as important as the values we stand for. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone from uh, joining. Uh, we'll make available the, the slides. And um, yes, continue to follow our open class on, on disabilities. Thank you.